I'm going to explain what erasure code is. Uh, who knows what, how erasure code actually works? Raise hands. I know a few of you do. A yeah, bit. a little bit. So, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I will start by explaining that. Uh, what I like about erasure code is it's a feature that saves space. That's the whole uh, goal of erasure code. Uh, but what I like also, beside the technical thing, is that it was massively uh, community-driven uh, feature. So when I started working on that, uh, I was not part of Red Hat, now I am. And uh, the company who hired me uh, wanted a new feature in Ceph. So they, they started to allow me to contribute that. In the end, it was uh, an effort. Uh, as you will see, involving both uh, Ink Tank and the set original Ceph developer, because it's a very difficult feature to add, but also a large number of people in the community. My, the reason why I love that is because my background is mostly in free software. I'm first a free software lover and then a developer, and I've been uh, involved in both uh, for the past 30 years. It's rare to see a very old developer. I'm about 50 and well I guess it's a passion and it's uh, the reason why I do that is because I believe it's a craftsmanship. It's not engineering really. We, we call uh, the division in which I work is called engineering. But I see myself as an individual making something beautiful and original code has been my life for the past 18 months or so. And it will keep to, I will keep doing that for another few months, but now it's mostly finished. Uh, I should, okay. So the, the goal of original code is to save space. Uh, when you are a Ceph user, you rely on Ceph to recover your data when you lose it. So when an OSD goes down, you say to Ceph, ah, did I lose data? No, Ceph says, no, I did something to uh, make it so you don't lose data. But of course, that takes uh, a lot of space and you don't want that. You want to use less space. The general idea is to do the same thing that you have in boxes when you buy a red five uh, box in a shop where you have three disks and you can lose one. So erasure code is really just that. You see that uh, it's not magic, but to understand it very simply, I would like to propose a role playing game where you will get to play bits. So I, I need four bits, who volunteers? Okay, I have two, three, please come. A fourth bit, maybe. Okay, so thank you, gentlemen. So the four bits will be in two OSDs. Let's say we have two OSDs. So you are in this OSD here, and you, gentlemen, you, you come here, and you are in this OSD. So you are storage. Now I will play the user. So. Uh, what I will do is I will store data into the OSDs. So these are my bits. I have, uh, oops, is I have two identical. Ah, this way. So I have zero and one. Now. I store that to the primary OSD. You are the primary OSD. So I, I give it to you. You have the zero, you have the one. And the OSD sometimes goes down, but sometimes it's up. So you are up, so I can read your data, one and zero. Now when I say you're down, you switch, you flip the, the cards, go on, you're down now. You flip the cards. Oh, so I cannot read it anymore. So that's your role as an OSD. So since you are the primary, let's say you're up, so you, you switch it. What is your task as a primary OSD? In a replicated model, you will start by copying the bits that you have to the secondary OSD. So let's do that. 
there. Now my data is more safe than before. Uh, and as a user, I get the acknowledgement that all is good. Now it turns out that all of a sudden you are not available. And as a user, I go to you say, oh, you're down. Okay, I ask the monitor to give me another OST and because, oh, I can read it. Oh, fantastic, that's good. Now you come back up and so on. That's the replicated model we know. But it's very expensive. I mean, you are extremely expensive. <laughs> you will be disposed of and we will do a little magic. Please, you can return to your space. We will try to do the exact same thing, but with only three people. Now, here, error code comes to help. In the case of RED5, all the mathematics that error code uh, uses is this XOR table. That's also why it's so simple to embed in a box. All you need is to do XOR operations on every bit. If you have two zero, you have a zero. If you have two one, you also have a zero. And if you have two different bits, you have a one. And the magic with that is this. So I will take this back. And now we will need three OSD, not just two. So you stay here, you will come to the new OSD, and you will be on the third OSD. So as a user, what I do now is this. It's a little bit more complex, but it reflects what actually happened in error code. It's a little bit more complex. So I have my data. Now I have three OSD. So I asked Seth to give me uh, a pool with uh, PG with three OSDs. I restore that, I give it to the primary OSD. So he has these two bits. Now what, what, it, what it does, let me find that. It does, yes, no, shoot. <laughs> I, have a, I have a coding chunk, oh yes it is, here. So I give you this and you compute a coding chunk based on what I gave you. So you have one and zero here. So you have a coding chunk that has been calculated that is one. So now you have three. And you distribute two of them to the other OSDs. So you give one here, another here, and here we go. And now you acknowledge, now that you've done the mathematics, now that you've done the IO to distribute that, you acknowledge to me, okay, your data is safe. Now let's play the game of something goes down. So let's say you go down. So you're not readable anymore. I ask data, say, oh, I, I don't have it anymore. Let's see if I can recover it using the two chunks I have here, using this table. I have one, zero. So one, zero would give one, and I have one. That's exactly what I did uh, to begin with. So no mystery there. Now let's say this one goes down and you apply the same operation here, one and one. One and one, we have zero. Oh, we recover this one. And if you lose this one, obviously you have the same thing. So we have the same level of resilience that we had before. We can lose one OSD and not lose data and we don't need TACO anymore. So we saved actually money. So that's the whole game of Erger Code, and thank you very much, gentlemen, for participating. You can go back to your seat. So the, uh, this is very simplistic, but it has been a great success because uh, all the RED5 discs you can find on the market, they, that's exactly what they do. When it comes to uh, making a system that generalize this to more than one disk being lost, it becomes surprisingly complex. To tell the truth, I don't understand any of the mathematics involved. But you can have a system where you can lose four disks and still play this game of, I, I lost any of four disks out of 20 and I can recover what they contain. So with that, you can lower down your space usage 
from three petabyte, let's say, if you want to store one petabyte and you want to be able to lose uh, one disk out of, uh, let's say, two disk uh, simultaneously, then you go to three replica. So if you have uh, one petabyte to store, you will use three petabyte of raw storage with replication with a factor of three which is extremely expensive. And you can get exactly the same thing with a of code, but only with 30% more with this game. Now it looks like a steal, but it really is not. There is a trade-off. Otherwise, everybody will use that and just that. So one of the clever things that uh, Seth did at the beginning is to go for something that is simple and maximize the usage, not try to optimize before uh, resolving the larger problem, which is distributed storage. So we have replicated uh, at the beginning, and now we add something else that is more complex. The trade-off is about object mutation. So as we saw, instead of just uh, writing one object and then it being cop uh, copied over, it, it requires computation and it requires distribution of part of the object. That makes partial writes, for instance, in an object. Let's say you have an object that is four megabytes big. Uh, and how do you write in the middle of it efficiently? If you have done all the ca uh, calculation, you may end up being forced to recompute the coding for the 40 megabytes, which is not convenient. So you have to be clever about that. <laughs> the other thing that is more complicated is recovery. When you have replication and you lose one OSD, all you have to do is direct the user to the other OSD. When you lose one coding chunk, you have to actually recompute it make sure that you gather all the chunks for all the OSDs, compute the new, store it back, and then return to the user. It's more complex. So here is the trade-off. Here is the reason why you don't have, by default, original code. It's more complex. The solution to that in Ceph is to use tiering. So let's say you already have your Ceph cluster that is uh, already operational. You have uh, three replication factor, performances are good. Now it's grown to a few hundred uh, terabytes and you would like to save data. What you do is you make a second tier that is erasure coded and you ask the replicated pool to evacuate the cold objects into the erasure coded pool. So whenever an object has not been used uh, in a week, for instance, then it moves to the erasure coded pool. So it takes less, less space and it's completely transparent and you don't have to modify anything on your infrastructure. You just ditch out the old things. Of course, when you need it eventually, oh, uh, a month after that, someone reclaims the object. It, it can happen in a, a RBD uh, instance. For, a, for instance, you, you have um, a, an RBD volume where you installed an operating system, and six months after that, you do an upgrade. Then you will start touching blocks that you've not used in a long time. So when that happens, the tiering mechanism will reclaim the block from the erasure coded pool and we'll put it back in the replicated pool. That, that incurs some more delay, but again, it's a trade-off. So, uh, as I said, this, all this happened uh, both with original uh, self developers and community uh, effort. The really difficult part that happened between Emperor and Firefly was, and that's part of the reason why Firefly was delayed, is, was done by Samuel Just, who is the lead of the core development team, and David Zafman, 
uh, who is a developer in the same team. They know the intimates of the USD, and a lot of refactoring had to happen for a original code to actually work. So it was not at all about the mathematics that we saw and the complexity. It was all, all about making, making it so the OSD knows how to do the infrastructure required for erasure coding. On the other hand, which was much easier, uh, there is Jane, who recently joined, who is a contractor from ARM, uh, who does some optimization for ARM. And there is Andreas, who is from the CERN, and they have a need. He has experience in implementing uh, Azure coded storage, so he helped out uh, also. And I spent time also on this side that is creating uh, all the infrastructure that is necessary for the mathematics to happen and to cooperate with the internals of the OSD so that we can have this feature. Now the interesting thing I keep hearing about erasure code is, okay, uh, I would use Ceph, but I'm not too confident about this erasure code thing, so I will delay uh, my usage, because here is my plan. I have, today, I, I don't have anything, but I envision that in February next year, I will be using three petabytes, and that's way too much. I need erasure code. And so, oh, it's a showstopper. I will not use uh, Ceph yet. I will instead use another solution that has original code, and not just this year, but has had original code for many years. So I heard that many times over, and then I realized, why would you save space before you have shortage of space? So, okay, you have that. Now, it turns out that when you start running a Ceph cluster, you don't start with zero bytes. You actually provision something. And most of the time, you provision more than you actually need. So let's say, uh, hypothetically, you provision five petabytes, and you think yeah, that you will eventually want to save space because replication will eat too much of your space. That does not prevent you from starting with replication. Because eventually what you will do is you will have this original code uh, tier when you feel like you're ready to use it. That will just shrink the space you use transparently. You can add that after the fact. You don't need to use it right now. So uh, now another common question I had also uh, which is still, uh, I, I'm still not completely sure about that. If someone knows about reliability models, please say something. Reliability models is when, do you, uh, when are you likely to lose data? That's what we worry about. We rely on Ceph to not lose data. But it's not magic, eventually. There, there is a small chance that you will actually lose data. Now, when you, you tune your original code uh, pool, you want to tune it in a way that make it very unlikely to lose data. How do you do that? How do you do the math? There should be a formula. And actually, there is no formula. That's troubling. There, there are very complex papers about how to uh, do a a reliability model that will give you a percentage, a percentage of chance that you will lose data. But the reason, one of the reasons why it's not simple is how do you measure the likelihood that a fire will burn your data center? Don't actually measure that really. You have a percentage of chance that of that happening. It's very small. How do you integrate that? First, how do you get this number? You can't, and it impacts the reliability model of your data massively. So it's all about trying to evaluate probabilities of a catastrophic event and making it so uh, safe is not the factor that is higher than any other. 
So let's say you have one chance out of 10 that a fire uh, destroys all your data. You don't want SAFE to have one chance out of five to destroy your data. So another, uh, so when you think about how likely am I to lose my data, you should keep that in mind. Another thing is you, you cannot think in terms of any time. It's very complex. Over a year, over two years, over five years, I, I don't know. So I chose, and some people recommend that, that you choose to think about what will happen when you lose an OSD. So let's say, uh, as in your case, uh, you have 20 uh, machines, four OSDs per machine. Everything is running smoothly. This is your baseline. Now what you really want to know is what happens when you lose one OSD. Because then you lose one OSD means you, you lost one copy, or if you use erasure code, you lost one chunk. So you become more vulnerable to actually losing data. The chance of you losing data increased a little. But you, you want to know how likely it is that you will lose data if something else happens during this time. So the key factor that dominates that is you lose one OSD, all of a sudden Ceph will start to replicate data all across the cluster. So the OSD participated in many placement groups. And so the objects it lost are also on many OSDs. In your case, they are probably all over the place. So all of a sudden you lose one terabyte of data. The 20 machines will start to communicate to each other to replicate the data as fast as possible. This is recovery. This is the time frame where you are more, more vulnerable than you were. And you want to minimize this time frame because this is the time frame when if you lose another OSD, then the likelihood of lo actually losing data <laughs> still increases more. So typically in your case, you have a gigabyte network, I guess. Uh, recovery will be in the order of 10 hours. It's pessimistic. I tend to say, oh, it's one hour, and I have been criticized for that. Okay, let's be pessimistic. It's 10 hours. So during 10 hours, objects are being replicated. After 10 hours, you're back to normal. But in this time frame, you want to know how likely you are to lose another disk. And this is what matters. For, for that, you go to the disk manufacturer, to the statistics, and you find the mean time between failure, and you say, okay, there is a 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 percent chance that within 10 hours, one other disk will actually fail. So without going into details, uh, when you follow this trend of thought, you quickly discover that the bigger your self-cluster is, the faster the recovery, and the less likely you are, you are to actually lose data by a cascading event. Then one common mistake I wanted to point is what happens when you do backfilling on a new OSD. So some people came uh, very worried that, that when they put a new OSD instead of the other one, it takes 24 hours for it to fill up with the new data. You know that when you have all these OSDs, they are leveled to 40% of usage. You put one in 0%, all of the others will start pouring data into it until it's leveled again. And this may take 24 hours, but you don't care at all. What you care about is recovery. When you, you're backfilling a new OSD, what happens is that it moves copies from one OSD to another. But you still have the same number of copies. You are not more exposed to losing data than you were before. So this activity actually takes time and you don't care. So next month, next month uh, will be giant, uh, the new Ceph release, and uh, it has a few surprises for us uh, 
in terms of features related to Erasure code. Uh, the feature freeze actually happened uh, two weeks ago. So now we're not allowed to add any new feature. So if you look at what's actually in Giant, that will be in the release and nothing else. We're fixing bugs. Uh, so one thing that I worked on uh, during the past cycle is this problem. You're very ambitious, you have two data centers, and you use Erasure code to save space. And to do that, you decided to have K10 M4. K10 is, uh, when we did the example, we had K2. That is, I have an object, and you slice it in two, and you put it in two OSDs. K10 is, you have an object, you slice it in 10, you put it on 10 different OSDs. And M4 is the number of coding chunks you compute. It's basically the number of OSD you can lose before you lose data. So you have a total of 14 chunks for one object. And because I'm very ambitious, I have two data centers, I spread uh, seven chunks here and seven chunks here. Now with the current way in Firefly Erasure code is implemented, should I lose one chunk here, I will need to get all seven chunks from this data center here to reconstruct the missing piece, which is likely to be a waste. I mean, there, there must be another way, there is. That's called locally recoverable codes. So you will see that in the release notes, it's a new Azure code plugin where you can have this feature. So the idea is actually extremely simple. You're very likely, the, the most likely cause of you reconstructing a chunk is you lose one OSD. So let's say I focus on this. I lose just one OSD. I don't lose four, I lose just one. Then what I would like to do is to be able to recover it without crossing that asunder boundaries. So what, what the locally recoverable code plugin does, it, it just computes one additional chunk that is located in this data center and that just is able to reconstruct one of these chunks. So it's kind of a pyramidal thing where you have this specialized local chunk that allows you to stay local, hence the name. And you do the same in data center too. So if you lose just one chunk here, you use this local chunk and you repair locally, you do not need these other bits and vice versa. Of course, the price of that is instead of having uh, 14 chunks of equal size, now you have 16. So it's slightly more expensive. But if you think that the trade-off is good for you, then here you are. That also works uh, if you don't have two data centers or seven data centers, but if you have racks where the switch that is on top of your rack uh, is more expensive and you want to save bandwidth between the racks. So in the end, it's all about saving money. So it's actually uh, two independent uh, thoughts that you have. Uh, you ask the, in the crash map, you tell it, spread, uh, take two data centers, take seven uh, hosts, and that's where the data is. And then what Crash will give you is 14 OSDs that obey this rule. And then you feed it to the plugin, and the plugin actually has a mapping of where it should put the data and the coding chunks. So you have to tell it, okay, my division is that, and I want uh, the locality to be spread among all these uh, OSDs. Yep. Okay, the other news is about the ISA plugin. So that's what Andreas uh, worked on, and uh, Intel has made uh, an assembly language li library that does the computation uh, necessary for 
all this erasure code stuff completely optimized for their um, processor and actually leveraging all the SIMD, uh, single instruction multiple data, uh, Instruct, instruction set that you can find in the processors. So it's completely cryptic, but it has been done. And what Andreas did is he made a plugin that interfaces with that. That only works for Intel processors. And at the moment, it's 50% faster than the default plugin that is more generic. Uh, I think this trade-off will uh, likely be reduced uh, in the future. So, but if you only have Intel processors, at the moment you may be better off using the ISA plugin. So these are the two erasure code thing that appeared uh, in Giant. And uh, that's cool. Now, uh, there is another uh, of course, because it's optimized for Intel when uh, ARM, so that uh, there were very good results for Intel, optimization for Intel, uh, they decided to put some effort into supporting the NEON instruction set of the ARM processors, which is uh, a set of instructions to optimize SIMD uh, also. And that will be in Hammer in the next uh, version of Ceph. Honestly, I, I don't understand anything that Jane is currently doing with that. Uh, it's part assembly language, but also understanding what the Galois field is uh, deeply. So I'm, we're very fortunate to have this guy on board who understands both uh, the ARM uh, instruction set and the mathematics involved. So that, that will be optimized for, for Hammer, for the next version. It's actually almost ready now, but we are feature free, so I'm completely confident we will have it for the next release. And that's it. So that's my mail if you have any question. And uh, all the artwork uh, is from a friend. Uh, so if you have questions now, uh, how many time do we have?